Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Ming Nguyen, and I'm the director of the Shichang Collective Series. All our events are free and open to the public. Classes are welcome, and attendance slips will be available. So if you need one, please come to see me after the Q&A. A reminder about our next event. In his highly acclaimed book, Reagan and Reykjavik, 48 Hours That Ended the Cold War. Dr. Ken Adamant offered insights into President Reagan's leadership, especially his strategy for winning the Cold War. Dr. Adamant will do the same when he comes here next week and delivers a Chautauqua lecture right here at 7.30 p.m right here in this auditorium. His multimedia uh, presentation and title, Reagan and Reykjavik, a case study in strategizing, will serve as the 10th annual distinguished lecture in international studies. Dr. Adaman was director of the US Arms Control Agency during, 1980, during the Reagan years. He also serves as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and Assistant to the U.S. Sec Secretary of Defense. This event is part of the university's week-long celebration of the inauguration of President Benson. And Dr. Benson will introduce Ambassador Adaman. Getting back to tonight's event, I would like to thank Dr. Jana Weiss Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. John Wade, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Thomas Harrison, Dean of the College of Business and Technology, Dr. Bernard Lowe, Dean of the College of Education, Dr. Deborah Whitehouse, Dean of the College of Health Sciences, Dr. Alan Olt, Dean of the College of Justice and Safety, Ms. Bettina Gartner, Dean of EKU Libraries, Dr. Sarah Ziegler, Dean of the University Programs. Please bear with me only a few more. Um, Dr. David Coleman, uh, Interim Director of the Honors Program, Dr. Laurie Beth Miller, Director of First Year Programs, Doctors Charlotte Rich and Stephen Wilson, co-chairs of the EKU Reads Committee. I would like to thank all of them and their offices for sponsoring this event. This is a joint operation of the EKU Reads Committee, First Year Programs, the Chautauqua Lecture Series Committee, and I worked very closely with Stefan, Charlotte, and Laurie Beth, and I enjoyed every single minute of it. And thank you so much for uh, coordinating this event with me. The EKU Reads program is designed to provide new students with a common introduction to academic life at Eastern. Each fall, EKU engages in a campus wide discussion of a book selected by the EKU Reads Committee through a variety of first-year classes. It is for this reason that I would like to ask all members of the EKU Reads Committee, all members of the English 101 faculty, and any other instructors who use Canvas Blackberry this term. If you are here, would you please stand up and be recognized? Please give them a round, a big round. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thank facility services personnel for this beautiful setup, and Jim Whitaker, media services supervisor, he's standing right here, you won't see him. Uh, he is responsible for uh, managing the AV for us this evening. So thank you so much for your service. Now, please give a warm welcome to our provost, Dr. Jana Weiss. She's going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dean. Welcome. I too commend our EKU Reads Committee because each year, for a number of years now, we require.
required a reading for a freshman class. And Penny, this, I believe, is the best book to date. And thank you for choosing it. I, too, read the book this summer. And with any good book, there are always important takeaways. I'll share quickly a couple of mine. The first takeaway is importance of gaps, or time between messages. Time to reflect on the person you've just connected with. And that's difficult when often, before I can finish responding to one email or text, another one pops up. You probably experienced something similar. Secondly, while the amount of personal communication has increased exponentially, perhaps we're less adept at being personal. This point was brought home to me this summer while we were on vacation. I was reading Hamlin's Blackberry while my husband and I were at the hotel pool. There was a family of four to the left of us. All of them were texting. And as I looked around, everyone else at the pool was also using their handheld devices, except for one other lady who was reading the book as I was. My husband was asleep, and about the time I was taking note of all of this, he woke up and said, I need to check my messages. We really are a connected society, aren't we? <laughs> and sometimes it has its disadvantages. No, even on our campus at one time not so long ago, we had a tradition that if we met someone on the sidewalk, we'd make eye contact and we'd smile. Now, too often, when you meet someone, what are they doing when you meet them on the sidewalk? They're texting, right? So tonight, as we listen to Mr. Power's presentation, let's think about how we can connect better at EKU, because that's really what we do. And at this time, we are delighted to welcome William Powers, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Hamlet's Blackbeard, Building a Good Life in the Digital Age. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University with a degree in history and literature. He began his career as a United States Senate aide, then joined the Washington Post, where he was a staff writer. He has written for The Atlantic, The New York Times, and many other publications. He is a two-time winner of the National Press Club's Rose Award for Best American Media Commentary. His book has been translated into many languages. He was the director of the Crowdwire, a project analyzing the role of social media in the 2012 U.S. presidential race. And in 2014, Mr. Powers joined the MIT Media Lab, where he's developing new tools for social disclosure. And on top of that, from my conversation with him tonight, he's a really nice person. So please give your undivided attention, don't be connected, while he's talking, except with him, to Mr. Bill Powers, and let's give him a warm EKU Colonel welcome. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? No? Is that turned on? Can you hear me now? Technical problem. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I can't really see your faces because of the bright lights, but uh, I'm thrilled you're here. And I hope we make a good connection, which as you know, those of you who've read my book is sort of my th theme, good connectedness, positive connectedness. Um, I want to thank Dr. Weiss for the very kind words um, and Ming for setting up this wonderful program. I'm thrilled to be doing a Chautauqua. I'm actually personally familiar with the whole Chautauqua tradition, uh, which I'll mention in one of my slides, and it's just a great honor to be here. I had a great day on campus today, various gatherings with students and faculty. It's a beautiful place, a wonderful feeling in your community. I think you're all really lucky to be here, and I feel very lucky to be here. Um, my book has been out for four years now, and it's been a fantastic journey. I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. I have to say that my favorite parts of that journey have been the times when I've been at uh, colleges and universities like this one, because one of the surprises of my journey as an author was that I wrote a book that connected with 
people in your generation, I know many of you are younger and our students here, um, I didn't think that would necessarily happen because I'm an older person, sort of a pre-digital person, writing about this topic, and I wasn't sure that there would be a place where we would meet and that people would find my message useful. I hope you have found it useful. And what I'm going to give you tonight is a sort of two things. I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory on kind of where the book came from, which I don't really say in the book for those of you who read it. For those who haven't read it, I'm also going to give a brief sort of summary of how the book works. Um, this talk is open to the public, so I figure I want to give those people a taste of the book. I'll make that as brief as I can. And then I want to tell you sort of my favorite part of the talk tonight, which is the what happened after the book came out. You know, every book has a backstory, as I said, and every book sort of also has a a future story or a frontward facing story about what happened after it was published. What the world did with the book and sort of what happened to the author as a result of the book. And in my case, this journey took me to really the most surprising places I ever, the last places I ever would have thought I would wind up. Wind up. As a sort of outsider writing as a critic of technology, I never thought I would be invited inside the tent to sort of participate in the defining of the digital future. And in fact, that is what happened. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got to MIT, as Dr. Weiss mentioned, and what I'm doing there. And um, then we'll open it up to questions. I'd love to have a dialogue about the book and sort of hear your thoughts about it and answer any questions you might have. So first, um, it's kind of to the, to the, how the book came to be and the backstory that I don't really tell in the book. So um, about six years ago, um, this was happening. This is the launch of the first iPhone. Maybe it's eight years ago. But in any case, this is a picture from Fifth Avenue in New York, the massive crowd outside the Apple store the day the first iPhone was launched. And um, I like to show this slide because to me, it represents many of the great things about a revolution like the one we're living through, the excitement of people about human innovation. This amazing gadget had appeared on the marketplace. People were thrilled to have it. They were willing to wait, in some cases, in line around the block to have a first shot at using it and owning one. I think this is sort of the creativity of our age at its best. And as I say in the book, I'm sort of an early adopter type who has always loved technology. And so this is the part of the revolution that I think is wonderful. And during those days, and in fact, from the early digital days in the 90s, I've been a kind of early adopter person who sort of liked to be in line to get the first thing. And so I very much can relate to that picture. This picture kind of reminds me of what a, a tech revolution should do for us, this happy girl in a beautiful green field. It should sort of open up the world and existence to us, make us feel not just connected, but stimulated, enlarged, really in touch with the rest of humanity and even the universe through information in a way we never have been before. And for much of the digital revolution in the early days, I really felt that way. I, I still feel that way today. It's a big part of my response to the digital revolution. But there was a certain point, um, as I say, about six or eight years ago, where I began to feel something else. I began to feel um, a sort of traffic jam in my mind, in my consciousness. I began to feel that I was paying all kinds of prices for getting more and more connected as dial-up turned into broadband and broadband went Wi-Fi. And pretty soon, you could be connected to everybody who's got a digital device 24-7. They were all in reach of me. I was all in reach of them. And frankly, I began to feel a little bit overwhelmed. Now, partly that's a function of my age. Many of you are digital natives. I'm not a digital native, so I was, and in many ways still am, in a kind of a transition period. But I felt that there was a, a bunch of costs that we were paying that actually weren't necessarily related to age. I saw it in my work, where um, I began to have trouble as a writer. I was, at the time, a, a media critic writing for newspapers and magazines. Um, I began to feel that I had trouble sort of holding a thought. I was constantly giving in to distractions that were coming at me from my screens. I began to find that it was hard to stay with a book that I was reading, somebody else's book. I 
love reading. It's why I went into writing. I majored in history and literature, so I'm a, a lifelong reader. And I found that I would get like two pages into a book and I had to go flee and go check something else, which you can probably guess what I was checking, to see if there were any new messages, any new sort of calls from the beyond. And that started to bother me. And the other price I was paying, as I talk about in the book, was, um, was in my family life. I began to feel that my wife and my son and I were beginning to sort of be pulled apart from each other by our screens, that we were paying more attention to what I call the digital crowd, all those people you can reach through the screen, rather than each other. And it was happening uh, practically every night. I call it in the book, as those of you who've read it know, the vanishing family trick. We would gather in the living room to be together after dinner, and one by one we would peel off to go attend to our screens. That wasn't the kind of family life I wanted to have. It wasn't the kind of connectedness I feel is the best kind of connectedness. I love the digital, but I feel that it needs to be uh, leavened and offset by experiences in the here and now, like we're having right now. And I wasn't sure what to do about it. So these are kind of the, I felt that there was a kind of a war on the consciousness that was happening, on my consciousness. And these were the casualties that I was feeling, uh, I was, the prices I was paying. Focus, inability to focus, immersion in my own world, in my family, in the things happening around me, engagement with people in my life. I felt that sort of trailing off in favor of just screen-mediated engagement. And this word that, if you've read the book, you know is my favorite word in, in um, describing what I think life should be all about, depth. I think that if we really want to show up for our lives and make something of them and, and really experience this amazing world as fully as we can, we need to go deep. We need to be able to sort of be in the moment, be present for things that happen to us, experience them fully. I think depth in anything you do, in connecting with a person, in reading a book, in watching something unfold, going deep and really experiencing it with all of yourself is the most valuable thing you can do. And I really felt that that wasn't happening to me. It was happening less and less. I was sort of skating the surface of life rather than going deep under the surface. So the question was, what, should, what to do about that? So when I have a problem and I'm trying to think about what to do about it, the first thing I do is, as a writer is I try and find a way to describe it. And I decided that I needed to put a kind of a, a word or a phrase to what I was experiencing. And I realized that we were living effectively by a philosophy, even though we hadn't called it a philosophy, nobody had named it, that I called digital maximalism. The more connected you are, the better. And you can't be too connected, basically, 24-7. And I felt that it wasn't the philosophy I wanted to live by. It wasn't the philosophy that was going to take me to that place of depth and fulfillment in my life. It wasn't the philosophy that was going to create the family experiences that we wanted to have, and that we needed to have a new philosophy. So I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'd never written a book. I had an opportunity to um, have a fellowship for a semester at Harvard University where um, I was able to um, spend three or four months researching any subject I wanted, and I decided to spend those months looking at this question of sort of how can we rethink digital life and go about it in a better way and maybe move past digital maximalism. So I did this fellowship, and I started thinking about this question, and it basically led me to embark on this book, Hamlet's Blackberry. The process of embarking on writing the book was interesting. You know, most books that are written about technology are written from a pure technology perspective by people who love technology. That's their specialty. That's sort of what they bring to bear in the book. A book about technology by somebody who really understands technology as it's unfolding today. I read a bunch of those books. They didn't answer this dilemma that I had about this way that they were living, so I decided I needed to write the book I wanted to read that would answer this question. And since I'm a humanities person, rather than come at it as a technologist, which I'm not, I'm a technology lover, but not a technologist, I would do it my way. I decided to basically go into the humanities that had been the center of my education and start doing some reading and really focus on some thinkers who would help me sort of find a solution to this question and maybe get to a place where I could write a book that would help people. So I went into the past and I started reading a lot of different thinkers. Um, I'm just going to mention a few as examples. In the book, I wound up using seven of them. 
Uh, and I went all the way back to ancient Greece. Um, the first thinker I talk about is, uh, I talk about Socrates, who we know about through Plato. So it's actually a combination of Plato and Socrates. But you know, basically, in ancient Greece, there was a similar revolution happening to the one we're living through now. It was the dawn of the alphabet. The alphabet was sort of the iPhone of ancient Greece, believe it or not. And people were struggling with the alphabet, even as they were excited about the alphabet. And I tell the story of how Socrates, though he was one of the smartest men who ever lived, kind of missed the boat on the alphabet. He actually was one of these Luddite types who thought that the alphabet was going to destroy people's brains. He actually warned his students, stay away from that alphabet thing. Writing, you don't need writing. Conversation is all we need to get along as a civilization. He was obviously very wrong about that. Fortunately, we know about Socrates because his student, Plato, violated his rules and write, wrote down all the dialogues, which is why we have them today. The other thing Socrates did is, that was a positive thing is he sort of stumbled in one of his dialogues, which is called Phaedrus, on the notion that when you're trying to solve a problem or wrestle with a question, it's often very helpful to put a little distance between yourself and kind of the busyness of everyday life, of immersion in the crowd. And in this particular dialogue, he goes for a walk with his student, Phaedrus, and they have a fantastic conversation that goes to places they probably never could have gone if they had stayed in the city of Athens, surrounded by all that noise and busyness. And so it's a lesson in kind of distance and the power of distance and in opening gaps, as Dr. Weiss said, between yourself and the rest of the world. Wonderful things can happen when you put a little distance between yourself and everything else that's happening in the world. The second uh, thinker I want to mention to you who was very helpful to me as I did my reading for the book is Seneca, the Roman philosopher, who was also a very busy statesman. And uh, I talk about Seneca at length in the book. He's really one of my favorite people in the book. I won't go into detail now, but I love this phrase that he used to describe what it was like to live in ancient Rome about 2,000 years ago. Rome itself was a kind of a technological revolution. They were the ones who first created big roads that could connect an empire. They created the idea of a postal system. They all had all kinds of brilliant innovations. But it made life a lot fuller of information, more, full with, more filled up with information. And it made life harder to navigate. And Seneca writes in one of his letters that the people who his sort of friends and colleagues that he spent his time with 2,000 years ago were suffering from the restless energy of a hunted mind. I read that phrase. And I went back home uh, in the evening, and I said to my wife, let me read this. I read her a couple sentences that included this phrase. And I said, when do you think that was written, the, end, the restless energy of a hunted mind? She said, six months ago? I don't know. I said, 2,000 years ago. This challenge that we're dealing with is not actually new. It's a version of an old challenge that people have been dealing with for a long time. I found great solace in that thought. I realized, hey, I'm not alone. People generations before me have faced this problem and actually obviously solved it because here we are. Civilization didn't fall apart. We're doing great things. We can figure this out. Um, the next thinker I want to mention who's in the book and who gave it its title is Shakespeare. And the revelation about Shakespeare that I found in my research was that uh, Shakespeare lived during the print revolution. And same thing. People in the print era really felt overloaded by all these, you know, newspapers had been invented. Newspapers started piling up in people's houses. They couldn't keep up with sort of what was published. Printed books were growing in popularity and becoming more accessible to people. It was an information explosion that was actually creating a version of information overload, similar to what we've seen in, in our time. And Shakespeare actually touches on this in some of his plays. And there's a moment in Hamlet that's actually about this, where Hamlet is, has just met the ghost of his father for the first time. And he talks about his, his mind being sort of a, a crowded series of noises and detritus and things he wants to get rid of so he can focus on just one thing. And it's very hard for him to do that. So when the ghost starts speaking to him, he takes out of his pocket a little tablet that has a stylus takes the stylus off, starts writing in the tablet, taking notes. And it turns out that that tablet was called Tables. And it was an amazing uh, tech innovation of um, Renaissance England and France. 
that grew in such popularity that people became completely dependent on and even addicted to their tables and taking notes all through the day on everything that happened to them. And the beauty of the table was that you could, at the end of the day or any time you wanted, remove the information with a swipe of your finger, just like on our phones, really. And that's why the book is called Hamlet's Blackberry. It could have been called Hamlet's iPhone if I'd written it a little bit later. Um, the idea that there was a device that actually was A, addictive, but B, the beauty of Hamlet's Blackberry was that it actually helped people get control of their busy lives in an information explosion. It was actually a positive device. And my message in talking about Shakespeare in that part of the book is that that's where our innovators should go, I believe, is toward using the devices to help us wrestle all this information to the ground, rather than feeling distracted, divided, overwhelmed by it. And uh, finally, um, another favorite of mine in the book is Henry David Thoreau, who many of you probably know, was the uh, Massachusetts uh, philosopher and writer who decided that the tech revolution of the 19th century was starting to overwhelm people and cause them to sort of skim the surface of life, just as I feel we're doing today. And so he went off to his little cabin that he built at Walden Pond to see what it was like to put some distance between himself and the busy town of Concord, where he had spent most of his life. And he wrote this amazing book, Walden, that's about the things he learned at that pond for the two years that he lived there. And the importance of opening up that gap between yourself and the crowd and all the wonderful revelations and reflections and creativity that can happen to you when you learn how to do that. My favorite thing about Thoreau, my favorite finding about Thoreau is this quote from one of his speeches that he used to give in the mid-19th century, where he was talking not about the telegraph or the railroad or some of these other modern inventions of his time, but actually the invention that went back to Roman times, the post office. And he says that people in his time were living so much on the surface of life because of all these pulls on their attention that they were actually um, barely paying attention to each other and barely connecting in the real sense of the word, word. And they were actually addicted to going to the post office. And I love this quote where he says, people would go to the post office five, six, seven times a day to check their mail, see if there were any new messages. And Thoreau's quote was, in proportion as our inward life fails, we go more constantly and desperately to the post office. I love that idea of Thoreau paying attention to the inward life, because I think that is the aspect of existence that really, really is sort of shunted aside when you are too connected to the rest of the world and spending all day navigating those connections. And that's really the, the problem that I wanted to solve. So um, a kind of a, a nice way of summing up how I felt as I had read all these philosophers and was kind of evaluating their thoughts vis-a-vis -vis my own life was something that Thoreau's teacher, the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, said at one point. He said, my life is superficial. It takes no root in the deep world. I felt that way about myself. I really wanted to solve that problem. And I was in search of ways to do it. And the more I read, um, the more I felt that the book should focus on the personal journey the things that I was feeling as an individual, not try and make, take a macro look at the whole connected world and how should networks be formed and how should governments deal with digital connectedness and so forth. I decided to sort of focus on my experience because I like it when writers, I've always liked it when writers take their own life as a sort of metaphor for or a, a kind of a um, talisman for everybody else's life because in many ways our experience is similar. And we know that what's happening to us, what we're feeling, whether it's insecurity, anxiety, happiness, all these things that we go through every day, other people feel something similar because we're all human beings. So um, the, fi the final thinker I want to share with you is somebody who didn't make the book, even though I actually love his philosophy very much, but it sort of didn't make it as a standalone chapter in the book. And that's Robert Persig, who wrote the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And if any of you out there liked my book, I really strongly urge you to read this book because it is a, a real revelation. It's an amazing journey into the combination of modern technology and ancient philosophy and how you can use the latter to help understand the former. And uh, Persig, who himself was a tech person in a way, he, his, his, his profession before he became a book writer was writing tech manuals 
like the sort of things you read when you get a new device and you're trying to learn how to use it. He would write those manuals back in the 70s. He became exasperated by not just the way technology was changing people's lives, but the way people rejected the technology or blamed the technology for their problems. He actually loved technology. And he kind of set out on a journey on a motorcycle, actually, across the country to think about ways that we could reconcile the technology that is defining our lives more and more with our own happiness and with having the best experience of life you can possibly have. And his very simple quote that I go back to often is, the test of the machines always your own mind. There isn't any other test. And that sort of encapsulates my thought. Um, if my mind isn't operating and functioning happily and smoothly and creatively and effectively with these devices, something has to change. Either the devices have to change or my philosophy has to change, maybe both. And that's what I set out to examine in the book. And basically, it comes down to this idea of distance that I've been referring to, working to put some distance between yourself and, and the busy digital world. And I found in my own experience that when I did that, when I was able to do it, like these philosophers from the past, I restored the focus, I restored the immersion, I restored the engagement, I restored the depth. All those things started to come back to me, and it was really wonderful. Distance makes a digital world more human, in my opinion. It takes us back to the best aspects of being a human being, so that we have this distance, we experience life away from all that busyness that has sort of taken over our lives, and then we return. We return to that world that itself is full of creativity enabled by the devices, and we're able to do more with it and contribute more to it, and I think that's a beautiful thing. So in the book, finally, uh, toward the end, I outline um, basically the ways to, that, I, that I had experimented with doing this myself. The theory being that to lead a happy, productive life in a connected world, you have to master the art of disconnecting. The more connected you get, the more you have to work on that art of disconnectedness because, in my opinion, it's where all the magic is. So one of the things I suggest in the book, and in fact I talk about some of these things having done them in my own life, is something called Walden Zones, which is named for Henry David Thoreau's experiment. And a Walden Zone is simply a room or a space in one's house or apartment that is kind of set apart for no devices, for a place where there's kind of no digital interaction and it's about being. It's about quieting the mind. It's about returning to that place of presence and opening up one of those gaps and all the benefits it can bring. The second thing I talk about is a kind of a somewhat radical thing that my family and I did beginning in 2007, before, way before I was um, really embarked on actually writing the book. And it was something we called the Internet Sabbath. My wife and I just invented it one week when we just looked at each other exasperated by how much time we were giving to our screens and how little we were giving to each other and to our son. And we said, let's just go offline this weekend. Let's just pull the plug from the internet. At the time, we were all using our desktops and laptops, and we didn't have smartphones. So we literally could pull the plug, and there was no internet in the house. We did it. As I relate in the book, it was incredibly hard. We had total withdrawal. It was like without the internet, we actually didn't know who we were anymore. We were wandering around the house. There were tears, literally, the first weekend. Um, and I saw those tears, and I realized, wow, we really should have done this a long time ago. This is really an issue. We're that dependent on whatever you get, it is you get from digital. And a lot of it's wonderful. But I think a lot of it plays to our insecurities and to aspects of, of us that are very vulnerable. I think there are ways in which digital connectedness can actually not soothe our pain or relieve it, but in some ways make it worse. And so it's another reason why we need that distance. And after that first weekend, we looked at each other, my wife and I, and we said, OK, let's stick with this. Let's see how far we can go. It was hard for the first few months. It continued to be hard for those weeks, those early weekends. But after that, we reached a point where it became not just really natural to disconnect every weekend, but really, really exciting. And it got to be so much a part of our normal lives that we looked forward to it. And we started to think about things we were going to do with our time when we were offline. Uh, I got to read more books. We got to have more conversations. My son became a very passionate musician, a saxophonist, which he still is. Uh, that sort of flowered on those weekends when we were offline. 
we kind of restored our family life to what I had always hoped it would be and what I had seen was being lost was regained. And that was a pretty amazing thing for a little seat of the pants experiment that we'd never heard of anybody else doing. We just kind of invented it. And in the book, I, I write about um, the way that worked and recommend that other people come up with rituals, solutions, creative ideas like that. Not that anyone, most people could emulate what we did. My wife and I are both writers, so we had more flexibility to, um, to do this than most people do. You know, we didn't have a boss telling us, I want you online this Saturday, answering that email from me, whatever. But I do think that there are versions of this that everybody can do. Even if it's an hour a day, even if it's one little space in your house, I think a little disconnectedness goes a long way. Um, add all of these things up, and what I like to think about as the phrase that summarizes them all came from the philosopher Michel Foucault, technologies of the self. These ideas, these kinds of ideas where you reimagine, sort of innovate your own digital life, sort of take control of it for yourself, redesign it, are really technologies in a way. They're ideas functioning as technologies layered on top of the technologies themselves, and it's a very powerful thing. And in fact, so having written about all of this and seen the book published and so forth, um, a kind of amazing thing happened. I'm not going to take credit for this because I think these ideas were bubbling up from a lot of other corners of the culture, but it actually started to happen that people all over the place started to do, in the last few years, have started to do what are now called digital Sabbaths or digital sabbaticals. And there's a movement. This is an example of a... Um, kind of a center in San Francisco, which of course also happens to be the focus, the center of the digital revolution, where you can go on these digital detox vacations with this organization, and they, they actually advertise off the grid, no boss, no internet, no cell phone, no clock, no work. You get a break. You get to open up one of those gaps between yourself and the rest of the world. It's almost become a little industry, and I think that is kind of amazing and fantastic. So. Um, all of these ideas I've been sharing with you and solutions to the problem of digital maximalism, I now realize, I didn't realize this when the book was published, but I now realize, fall into the category of sort of the private sphere of life. You know, that sphere that is sort of me, my consciousness, my little world around me. I told you that I intentionally wrote the book about my experience, and that's true, but I hadn't really focused on the extent to which it was really limited to the private sphere, the, the Bill version of the world, and not so much connected to the part of the world that we all share that the technologists have really been focusing on since the beginning of this revolution, trying to build social networks, build, um, build a space in which we can be together that, that actually a space that has long been called the public sphere. That's the sphere that we share when we talk about politics, when we elect presidents, when we decide things as communities, when we join clubs, when we do all those things that people do when they come together. My book really basically avoided all of that, partly by design and partly unconsciously. And my expectation, as this dawned on me, as the book started to come out, that I had written this kind of book made me think that basically there would be no place for the book among the technologists, that they wouldn't really be that interested, that they actually might be offended by it, that they certainly wouldn't be a friend of my view of the world, and that I would basically either be condemned by them or never hear from them, that there'd be a silence. So I was sort of expecting something like that in the technology world. In fact, what happened was actually the opposite of that. This was the biggest surprise of all about the book, is that when it was published in June of 2010, the very first people I started to hear from, by email, or they would somehow find my phone number from my agent or whatever, I started to hear from all these technologists, calling me from Silicon Valley, from the area in Boston and Cambridge, that's a technology center and other places. I heard you on NPR, can we have a conversation? We really have this problem in my company, I really have this problem in my family too, can we talk about this issue of overconnectedness? I want to solve it. I want to solve it not just for me, but for my organization. So people were taking the book and actually transforming it on their own from a private sphere book to a public sphere book and viewing it as something that could be applied in a really a, a broader social way, which I frankly 
had not been smart enough to do. So I was impressed by that. I was inspired. I was moved that those people were willing to hear my criticism and respond to it. And um, the more of these people I met giving speeches, you know, sometimes they would invite me to a company retreat or so forth. The more I liked them, I actually liked talking to them about ways technology could be changed, the direction of it might be changed by them uh, to take it to a new place, that I started being open to some of the ideas they were throwing at me to work together. And in particular, I had an offer from a um, startup that had come out of MIT um, that was a social media analytics company. And what they did, it was called Bluefin Labs, and what they did was they had developed these uh, very advanced algorithms that could go into public social media, in particular Twitter and public Facebook, which is a little, maybe 10% of Facebook is public, and, and see patterns in the conversation there that are not detectable to any of us with the naked eye because it's too much data. These algorithms could, for example, look at Twitter on any given day and see what people were saying about X, fill in the blank. It could be a, a company brand. It could be something that was happening in the news. What was sort of the, the a conversation about? Even sometimes what was the sentiment? Was it negative? Was it positive? Um, kind of a fascinating tool. So the CEO, who, who um, was one of these people who responded to my book, called me in and said, look, we've got these powerful tools. Um, I think they can be used for things beyond just a profit-making business. Is there a way in which we could apply them to what's happening, this is 2011, what's happening right now, which is the American presidential election? That was the big news story that was rolling up as the Republicans started to, were moving toward choosing their nominee to run against Obama. He said, what about, you know, could we, could we somehow, his idea was that maybe they could sell the service to the two parties and that they would use it to help run their elections. He said, do you have any response to that? I said, well, if I were you, I wouldn't sell it to the two parties. I would actually give it away to the public and the media as a public service so they can see the power that technology has to go deeper, to actually take Twitter, which sometimes feels like a Tower of Babel, and turn it into something more meaningful and useful. So he said, gosh, I like that idea. Would you come on board and use your journalistic skills to do that? Maybe we could create a new sort of website that would be about analyzing the election every day from that point of view. So that's what we did. We created something called the Crowdwire, which I was the director of. And we had a little staff of technologists who I sort of trained to be journalists. And I did the editing and some of the writing. They did all the data crunching and all the kind of hard tech stuff that I would have no idea how to do. And basically, we took the two candidates and we followed how they were uh, talked about every day in social media. And indeed, for the people who followed us in the media, who sometimes quoted me in national media, um, it was a kind of a new window into this social media world that you're all a part of, but that thus far hadn't, I think, proven as useful to the public sphere as it might. So um, the Crowdwire got some attention, and uh, this is our um, the uh, little tool that we did on the last day, on, the, on election day, um, 2012. We did a, an algorithm that captured everybody on Twitter who said who they had voted for after they voted. So obviously that was just a percentage of the people on Twitter, because most people don't tweet, here's who I just voted for, but some people do. So we kept an automatic poll running all through the day of what those people were saying about who they voted for to see if we could somehow predict what was gonna happen at the end of the day. And this was the final tally. It was Obama trouncing Romney. I think this is Obama trouncing Romney by a much bigger margin than he actually did in the real voting on the election. But Twitter has a bias toward the left. So that's an explanation for that. But the point is that we discovered that you could actually turn Twitter into a kind of a poll in a way. It's not a poll that's perfectly representative of the, of the public at large, but an interesting poll. And a poll of people who were willing to speak to their little audiences on Twitter and say who they had voted for. Interesting experiment. As I said, it got some attention. And um, at the end of our project, possibly partly because of this, but other factors about this interesting company, Twitter wound up buying the company. And that company, Fin Labs, became Twitter Boston. So it's now they're very big. It's actually grown a lot operation in Boston. So um, that was a wonderful um, experience. Looking back on it after it happened, I sort of tried to analyze 
why it had worked out so well. It seemed very unlikely that I would go work with a tech startup and we would do something together. And I just never thought of myself as the person who was ever going to do that. Even though I like technology, I'm not a tech person. As I said, I sort of thought they would not be interested in me also. And I realized that it was that same, part of it was that same factor that led me to write a book that was a little different from the other books that had come out about technology. It was my humanities background. It was that I was bringing to bear history, literature, philosophy, culture in a digital age and saying this tradition of the past, these ideas that really have shaped our civilization, have a lot to teach us about what we're living through now. And we might be able to actually live through it more, more intelligently and more productively and learn things from that way of thinking that can take us to a new place. Um, also during this same period, the biography of Steve Jobs came out uh, called Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. And there was actually a quote that Steve Jobs gave to Walter Isaacson that um, kind of encapsulates what was actually happening to me as I sort of became part of the tech community. And it's this uh, quote from Jobs recounting his own career and what was it about his career that sort of was a big, what was kind of the, Isaacson asked him, what is sort of the key factor in your success? Why did you do it differently? And he said, I always thought of myself as a humanities person, as a kid, but I liked electronics. Then I read something that one of my heroes, Edwin Land of Polaroid said about the importance of people who could stand at the intersection of humanities and sciences. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. And I think that when you, when you look back on Jobs' career and the history of Apple and you see that phrase, think different, that's not the only thing that they were saying with that phrase, but I think it's a part of it. I think that Apple had a way of coming at us that was actually trying to be more human. You know, the root of that word humanities is human. That was trying to get at where we live more fully than the competition had done and then the predecessors had done. And that's the reason they succeeded. That was a big step forward for technology, in my opinion. I'm very happy to have those Apple products. I don't know how many of you use them, but they're wonderful. You know, they're an incredible innovation. They've taken us to a whole new place with apps and, and tablets. And, and it's kind of amazing to me to think that it came out of what Jobs says, this kind of conjunction of the humanities and the and, you know, this is something that anybody that's at a university, like you guys, has the opportunity to do. Because, of course, every university has both. Even MIT has humanities departments, English department, history department. And it's the notion that by pulling on both threads and sort of weaving them together that you get the real innovation that matters and that goes the furthest and that serves people's needs the most that really inspired me. So um, just to finish this story of the journey I'm on now with the book, uh, or that the book took me on, um, so that project ended, as I said, the company became part of Twitter and I went off to, to my writing journalism and still speaking about the book like here and so forth and um, circumstances brought me together again with um, the, um, the fellow who had been the CEO of that company and we started talking about ideas I wanted to work on and I actually shared some technology ideas that I had had as a result of our project and that I think were kind of rooted in my humanities background. And I shared a couple of them that were especially important to me and at the end of that conversation he said, you know, I'm about to start a new lab at MIT that's going to be about kind of rethinking the whole social media landscape and taking the public sphere uh, seriously and thinking about ways that we can not just create social devices that disrupt the old world, but that build a new world, that are constructive, constructive social devices, sustainable social devices, social networks and social media that somehow take us to the next level in the digital age. And would you like to join me in doing that? So it was an amazing invitation. I never thought I would go back to a university again. And we kept the conversation going for a while. And uh, we wound up, I wound up joining him at something that just launched two weeks ago called the Lab for Social Machines at MIT. And it's exactly what I just described to you. It is a lab um, that is all about rethinking social media, solving problems with social media that haven't been solved before, 
and being constructive about social media, taking it to a new depth so that we can really hopefully change the world in ways that go beyond. I mean, I don't want to be uh, cavalier about what social media have done so far, but when I see one of those cat videos flying around, <laughs> I think to myself, you know, there's more we can do with this than what we've done so far. We're just at the beginning of this revolution, and this is a great opportunity to be part of it. So I have signed on. I got an appointment at the MIT Media Lab, which is this sort of wonderful center of innovation. We have a team of about 15 people who've come from all over the world, masters and PhD students mostly, and we're now working on a bunch of projects that are very interesting. One of them, just to give you an example, is a women's safety uh, project that's going to be based in India that's an attempt to use social media to solve this terrible problem of, of rape in India uh, that seems to happen so often of uh, you know, innocent women who are sort of accosted sometimes by gangs of men and it goes out of control and some, in, in the worst case of all, the women died uh, not so long ago. A terrible situation. We feel there's a way that social media might help women in India and other places be able to be in touch with their communities wherever they are so they could put out an alert that they're in danger or learn from others where are the places where they might be in danger. Kind of enrich the information so that the world will be safer for them. That's just one example. Um, another one is we're trying to rethink the notion of debate in the digital world and solve the problem that I think is a significant problem that's very hard in social media today to have a focused one-on-one -on -one back and forth debate with someone that you disagree with but that you want to have a sort of a back, constructive back and forth because there's so much noise. I see people on Twitter all the time trying to have a conversation with someone about something they care about, and there's so much noise around what they're doing that they wind up saying, let's take it to email, let's take it offline. I think there's a way on social media to actually have the democratic conversation and debates about ideas we really care about that we haven't figured out yet, and we're going to be working on that at the lab. So uh, when we launched, we got quite a bit of media attention, as I said just a couple weeks ago. Partly it was because Twitter is funding this lab for $10 million over the next five years. Um, Twitter has no uh, say over what we do, and they have no ownership of what we produce. They're just doing this as a good deed. Um, and um, I got a kick out of that one headline that was in the Wall Street Journal. Twitter, MIT, create new research lab to analyze every tweet. As you may know, there are 500 million new tweets every day. So there is no way we're going to analyze every tweet. But we do have access to Twitter going back to the very first tweet, which nobody else, no other academic institution in the world has. And we're going to be able to churn all of that conversation that's been happening all these years now into new ways of analyzing this, the public sphere and hopefully doing some constructive things with it. So um, my message is that a book is an interesting thing. You know, a book, you think a book is going to be one thing, and you do your job the best you can when you're writing it, and it comes out and it really becomes, it takes on a life of its own, and it winds up teaching you things. Everywhere I go, um, universities, high schools, bookstores, I wind up learning things from the people there who have either read the book or are curious about it, wondering why I did it. Um, and I've learned an amazing amount from the technologists who I never thought would care about the book at all. And it kind of goes back to the epigraph that you may have noticed, those of you who've read the book, I put at the beginning of the book, and I brought this girl back because I want her to be our mascot in the digital age, the quote from Emerson that is at the very beginning of the book. This time, like all times, is a very good one. Sorry, I have a repeat there. It's a very good one if we but know what to do with it. And I think that is the essence of how we should think about the digital age and any technological age. This is a good time if we know what to do with it and if we think about being creative, being innovative, taking it to a new level. Never assume that the way digital connectedness is happening right now is the be all and end all of digital connectedness because it's not. There are things happening out in the future that we can't even imagine and you all can be part of that. The students who are here tonight, 
are exactly the right age to define this digital revolution, to take us to those next steps. Much better equipped than I am as an older person to do it. You folks are digital natives, and it's really up to you to take your education, maybe that combination of humanities and sciences that I think is the magic, and really join in this remaking of this amazing moment that we're living through so that it is all it can and should be. So with that, I thank you for listening. Um, I think we have a nice stretch of time now to answer questions and have a conversation. So if you guys are game for that, let's do it. I think I might come down off the stage and, and take questions. Thank you. So is this okay if I'm right here? Sure. Yeah, okay. Somebody has to break the ice. Here's one up front, yeah. So, could, could you say your name? Right, so in other words, are you talking about the business model? Like, am I worried about, yeah, the future of, public? yeah. So, yeah, it's a great question. It is a very exciting and scary time to be a writer. It's an exciting and scary time also specifically to be a journalist. You know, as a newspaper person, it's been a real shock to see it all fall apart. When I went into newspaper journalism, uh, almost right out of college. I had that one stint as a US Senate staffer and then I went to the Washington Post. At that time at the Post, when I was a staff writer in the early 90s, when I was starting out, it seemed like it was never gonna go away. It seemed like the most powerful thing on the planet. The Washington Post had taken down the president in Watergate and money was rolling in and when I wanted to go do a story in California or London or anywhere I wanted to go, they didn't even ask me the cost. It was incredible what a fat time it was to be a journalist. And look, here we are 20 years later, it's, it's really all gone. It's all crumbled. And that's a terrible thing, a kind of tragedy, but I also think it's an opportunity. You know, it's a time to reinvent and maybe make something better than what was there before. I think it's kind of dangerous when people get fat and happy, and journalists had become that in many ways. Um, the book publishing thing is a different crisis, but related. It's very much dominated by Amazon now, as you know. Um, there's a kind of a, um, I don't know if you know about this, some of you probably do, there's a conflict going on between a lot of writers who've joined together who are kind of opposing Amazon on the way they've singled out one publisher for kind of um, description of books, people to buy their books, find their books. And I actually am part of a group called Authors United that has been sending publishing letters in the New York Times asking Jeff Bezos to reconsider, um, which I really think he should. And I think uh, Amazon, you know, they have a perfect right to do many things as a company in a capitalist economy, but um, having the right to destroy the publishing industry and doing it are two different things. And um, we want him to sort of find a middle way where he can continue to be a profitable company and essentially not be putting writers out of business. And I hope he and the company, we also did a letter to the board of Amazon, will, will listen to us because there's a lot at stake in books. Books have to find a new model that works, that can sustain itself, it's not here yet. And while we're in this middle period of figuring that out, it's really, really important that sort of business and society be, give us a little space. I think, to make it work. And so, fingers crossed, I hope that happens. I do think, at the bottom line, that writing will always have a future. People love to read books, they love to read stories, they love to read news. That is always going to be the case, and I am confident that somebody's gonna figure it out. Thank you.
Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So I love Marcus Aurelius, the, um, the Roman general and philosopher. Um, his meditations are one of the best books you could possibly read. Um, I read Marcus Aurelius again in writing the book, thinking that maybe he would have something to say for this book. And he really never addresses the question of sort of technology and connectedness and this idea of dealing with kind of the overload of living in a connected society the way Seneca did. I felt I should only have one Roman in the book. And so that was really why I went with Seneca. I think as a philosopher, like a whole philosopher, learning how to live, Marcus Aurelius is probably actually a more valuable read than Seneca. But Seneca on this question just cannot be beat. He was so good at talking about what's going on in here and how to manage it better that I went with him. So that's the reason. But I would never question anybody wanting to read Marcus Aurelius for inspiration. I love the Stoics. He's a great Stoic. Thank you. So do I think the panic, is, the worry is overblown? So I think in the long run, we will look back and feel that most of the negative um, discussion and coverage of today's technology that we are seeing now was a kind of short-term panic, because I feel that most of these problems will be solved, even in our lifetimes, the ones we're worried about now. There will be new ones constantly coming along. And I think the things we're worried about are legitimate worries, not just the things I talked about, which is sort of about the consciousness and quality of life and so forth, but things like privacy. You know, there's a big debate now about privacy and, and um, data and the way that companies increasingly treat us all as sort of data with dollar signs on it, and is that okay? And how much they know about us, and do they have a right to know, and does the government have a right to know all these things? Um, the point, though, is that we're having the debate. <laughs> we're talking about it. And it really is similar to debates that have happened in previous technological revolutions where people had to sort of figure it out. You know, uh, the printing press was very controversial at the time. There, were, there, were cla there was class war about the printing press because, I talk about this briefly in the book, because illiterate people, which was most people at the time the printing press came out, viewed it as a threat. They saw literate people as getting sort of special privileges in society and really kind of wielding power in a new way. And they didn't like what was happening. Shakespeare even has a section of one of his plays that's about this. We figured that out. You know, we figured out a lot of things that the print, a lot of questions that the printing press raised. And I think that we're going to figure these things out. But it requires all of us to pay attention and really participate. And that's another reason why we need to reform the public sphere and come up with new ways of communicating that kind of allow that conversation to flower in a better way. Right now, to me, it feels kind of cacophonous and chaotic, and it needs some structure. And that's one of the things we're going to be doing at that lab. Thank you. Other questions? Here's one. Yeah, so I think the uh, mic is not working that well. Um, I can hear you, but I'm not sure everybody else could. Um, so you asked, um, just to repeat the question, um, have I heard from people who tried what we did and, and what was their experience like? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard from a lot of people. Um, so I've heard from individuals talking about their individual lives and their family lives and all kinds of experiments they've done. Um, different from mine, but some of them told me they were inspired by mine. I can give you a couple examples that come to mind. So there was one person who called in a radio show on, 
And he said that he had this really great innovation he'd come up with for dealing with the digital overconnectedness of his family. And it was that he took, I forget if it was certain hours during the day or one day during the week, but he would take all the kids' phones and his wife's phone and I guess his own phone and put them in a jar, a glass jar that you could see through and cap it and lock the cap on there. And all the phones would be turned on so that everybody could see the phones buzzing and ringing and not be able to get at them. And he thought that, he claimed that this was a really constructive solution because people could see that what they were missing wasn't that big of a deal. Now that would not have worked in my family. Okay, that would have lasted, that would have lasted one hour and there would have been a rebellion. Because to me it seems kind of a little bit sadistic. But he was thrilled to share it, claimed it had worked. And that kind of reminds me of how, what an open field we have for everybody to be creative in their own way and do their own thing. And the other kinds of experiments I've heard people you know, get in touch with me to share are kind of more organizational experiments. Like I talk at a lot of elementary or middle and high schools. And those schools are often struggling with how digital should, what role digital should play in students' lives. Should they be able to have their phones in the classroom, blah, 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 because they're also using devices to learn, but yet sometimes they seem distracted. So I have heard from some schools that set up spaces that are kind of like Walden zones, but they give their own names to them. Like there was one school that created what they called their treehouse that was sort of an elevated, um, almost like a loft where when you go up in that loft, that's the place to get off devices and do things, kinds of creativity and thinking and do your assignments and you're away from your devices. And this person who told me about it from this school said it had been a great success. So yes, I hear from a lot of people. They often um, are just kind of wanting to say, thanks for weighing in on this and you were a factor in our conversation and we really appreciate it. Um, there are also people like that movement that I mentioned up there, the, um, the detox movement, who have started like businesses and things that are very much about the same ideas that are in the book, like bringing them to bigger audiences. I hear from them a lot and they'll ask me to come speak at one of their gatherings or whatever. So yeah, it's really happening all over the place and it's a little bit of a quiet movement that hasn't really, I think, been fully recognized, but it's happening. Thank you. Other questions? Here's one, two. Yeah, I don't know if that's working. If it works, we bring it back. That's better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But would there be a lot of economic value potentially in, in setting aside areas that could be marketed to the rest of the United States to come to Eastern Kentucky where you can check out a environment? Because it seems to me that most of the transcendentalists focus on transcending urban life. Right. 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 So, you know, if we kept these areas, many of these areas are still like cell phones, dead zones. Right. And they can't be on Instagram because it's a law now. Right. They can take a picture, but they can't see how many likes they got. And I'm just wondering if it's a good strategy that the region should consider. Because we're trying to figure out how to do this better. So, your idea is that. Eastern Kentucky doesn't have the coverage that a lot of other places have. Maybe that can be turned into a, a plus, right? So it's an interesting idea. I don't think I'm on board for it completely. I'll tell you why. I think that it's very important that this, this revolution is very powerful and it's where civilization is headed. And I think it's very important that everybody be able to join it that everybody be able to be part of it. The upside of it is massive. And people who are not joining it are really left behind. I mean, it's the equivalent of somebody who decided in, the, in 1910, no, I'm not gonna do that electricity thing, you know? 
that that would not have been a good fate for that person. Hard life, maybe they would have enjoyed aspects of it, but not easy. I think not having access to digital is that times a thousand because it's where, it's where prosperity is, it's where all the thinking is. So I think, I mean, this sounds like a weird way to say it, but I think that in order to reap the benefits of disconnectedness fully, you have to be connected first. And, and the happy medium is really the both. And so I would rather that Eastern Kentucky got fully connected the way you know, African countries are really more and more connected. And uh, I just had a meeting with some people this week who are bringing um, laptops to um, really remote villages in Ethiopia. These are some people at the Media Lab. And uh, they just give these laptops to these kids, and the kids don't even know what the internet is. There's no internet there. So these are just laptops with, soft, with apps on them. And the kids take the laptops, and one of the aspects of this experiment that's interesting is they don't give them any instructions. They just give them the laptop and say, play with this, and they see what happens. And the kids all learn how to use the laptop very quickly. They learn how to use the apps. They've never seen an app. They've never seen a screen before. They learn how to use it all, and they learn to read. They start learning to read. And these are kids who don't read in the language of Ethiopia or any other language, you know, let alone English. And it's not internet, because they're not connected, but it is the digital revolution that's enabling this for them. So I want to see those villages connected, too, so that those kids can go to the next level. I do think, though, that what you're saying about there being, that we collectively recognize places where maybe there's less connectedness, and we've Yes, yeah. I can attest that Western Kenya has better cell phone service. Yeah, and what, what, <laughs> Western Kenya has better cell phone than yeah. Kentucky, yeah. And that's and sad. Line. Yeah, that's sad. Um, I can imagine a future, you know, let's face it, the national parks, if they're not connected, they're all going to be. Eventually, there's going to be wireless everywhere. But I can imagine a future in which we might collectively, as a country that has these amazing national parks, decide, okay, Yellowstone Thursday, I'm just making this up, is offline. You can experience it the way it was experienced for hundreds of years, thousands of years, before there was even an America. And we're doing that because we think there's value in that. And then the next day it can be turned back on. And maybe that sounds grandiose and sort of ridiculous, but I can imagine things like that being very valuable. You know, that principle I put up there, the more connected you are, the more you need to master the art of disconnectedness. I really believe that that is a crucial skill for the future and that we're all going to more and more come on board for mastering that and wanting to do it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Todd. Todd Beach. Sure. So you're, you talk a lot in your, in your presentations and in your book about the shortcomings of connectedness in so far that they might prevent us from experiencing death at the level of our personal uh, existence. Yeah. And at the level and consciousness, of yeah. interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. between the people in our family. Yep. You mean consumption of consumer goods or consumption of electricity, or both? Consumption of resources. Uh huh. Uh huh. Consumption of energy. Yep. Um, and then also, so there's an issue of sustainability, which seems frightening and which seems to be related in complicated ways mm -hmm. to uh, the digital medium through which we consume. And then also, there's just the, the issue of justice. Yep.
Yeah, he says it's really built into capitalism, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's a big question. I, um, I think that these are huge problems you've identified, structural problems. Um, they're problems about the whole planet. Um, I've read a few books about the, um, the resource issue and the overcrowding issue and the, the kind of um, expiration date that we may be headed toward as a planet, and it's very scary. Uh, my favorite book along these lines is Consilience by Wilson, which, in which he does calculations about the extent to which we are reproducing and killing species and destroying the resources we need and sort of where that takes us 100 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years, and it's completely terrifying. Um, I do think that we're better equipped, though, to solve those problems together if we're all, if our minds can really meet and be in touch with each other as fully as possible. And that's happening because of digital. You know, you can now, I hate that, tired of that phrase, crowdsource, but you know, you can get a lot of ideas from a lot of different corners very quickly about any problem you want and not necessarily solve it, but get closer to a solution just because we're all connected. And a lot of resources are being used to make that happen. I mean, just when you look at the precious um, materials that are needed to make cell phones and so forth, it is scary. But I also think that the industry is under the gun to fix those problems. And part of it is that we're talking about them and having conversations about that question, again, through the devices. You know, it's like we have this wonderful self-monitoring um, system now that is the new public sphere. And it's where we are bird-dogging everything. And it's where a Snowden can, on his own, Edward Snowden can appear and say, I'm, I'm just going to get hold of this stuff and throw it out there because this problem just needs to be solved now. There's too much privacy. There's too much snooping. You know, I'm against that. One guy did that. The things that people can do together are remarkable. I mean, I like to think that Ebola is an example, or will be looked back on as an example, that this won't take off as the pandemic some people are threatening, because scientists all over the world are now in constant touch with each other talking about this and trying to solve it. And if they do, it'll be another notch in the belt of digital as a great problem-solving medium. So I hate to be Pollyanna. I am constitutionally an optimist. Um, but I do think that we have a better chance with this than without it, and that it kind of makes our individual intelligences much more valuable because they come in touch with the collective intelligence and can change it. And just on the question of Marx, you know, I'm not a Marxist, I suppose, but he's still a great read today. And as I tried to show in the book, it's worth reading these great thinkers from the past because they can teach us so much about not only how we're living now, but how we could do better. So I would recommend Marx to anybody. And, and I would recommend that people get it firsthand, not through somebody else's book. Thank you. Other questions? We're getting all the grown-ups now. Are there any student questions? I wouldn't mind hearing from somebody who just hated the book and wants to rant if you're out there. Here's somebody down here. Maybe it's a ranter. Hi. Hi. Both. Yeah. Uh huh. So uh, the question I wanted to ask you is, I'm also an immigrant rights activist, and the one thing I've noticed about um, social media is how um, people can change their mind like a 
about like political views, whether they are for it at one moment and against it the other way. And I noticed that sometimes it's um, peer pressure that does this to them. And I noticed that this works both ways. Um, you you could be anti-immigrant and then be and then be persuaded online to change your mind, mm -hmm. and then on the other side be on the other side be um, for immigration and then be anti-immigration online. And I've also noticed um, a lot, especially recently, that there's a lot of like just perpetual like hatred to use. Um, like sometimes racial slurs or bullying, or yep. bullying mm -hmm. online. Do you think? Do you think this um, sort of like this? Um, I don't know how to call it, but like evilness existed before social media, or do you think like social media is just perpetuating mm -hmm. uh, this evil, or did it always exist in our society? Well, thank you for the question. So um, obviously, evil's always been with us, and people who are mean and unthinking and insensitive about other people. I think two things have happened with social media that makes it easier for that to happen. One is you don't have to face the person. Even if you're doing Skype or Google Hangout or whatever, you're not really present with each other, so it's not the same thing. So this is why there are so many instances of this online bullying. You know, there's been a couple of really bad instances on Yik Yak, which is a social network that you know, allowed people to say things anonymously. Some schools have had terrible experiences of, of bullying you know, because it's anonymous. And um, so that's one reason. The other reason, related but slightly different, is there's this thing called the disinhibition effect of digital life, which is basically that, separate from the eye contact and everything, people when they're online, because it's like sort of a spirit version of themselves, it's not the real version, they kind of get to do this um, playing out of emotions and um, responses and reactions to the world that they wouldn't, that they would be inhibited from doing in the real world, but because it's this other zone where they feel relatively protected and all, out of bounds, they just do it. They're just, they're, they no longer have the inhibitions they have in real life, and they just, in some cases, become their worst selves, and we've all seen examples of this. So trolling, you know, all these things, it's really not the most pleasant feature of of digital life, I think, that we do this to each other. I do think that we are learning and growing out of it slowly. And the precedent I would give you for this is the change in digital manners over the last decade. You know, there was a time just 10 years ago, some of you are probably too young to really remember this, but like where people were like, like literally answering their phones in Broadway shows and talking on them during the show because cell phones were new and everybody thought they had to just answer every call that came in or some crazy thing. And people don't do that so much anymore. It's really tapered off. In the case of Broadway, what happened was a famous actress, Patti LuPone, stopped the show and said, you in the 10th row, turn that phone off or we're not continuing with the show. It made news, it made headlines, people began to be embarrassed, and it started to end. So I think we're learning, I think we're learning new behaviors and new ways around like the disinhibition effect. We're aware of it, which is part of the solution. And now it's something that we have to teach, really, and have be part of the conversation in families, in schools. And it's happening, but this revolution is so new that it's just one of many challenges we're tackling and we're kind of doing them all at once. So it's gonna take a while. So I think while it's happening, we have to kind of keep our center and feel confident that civilization has been through crazy moments like this before and we'll get through this one. Applaud the people who are good to each other and who use these devices constructively and denounce the people, if necessary, even publicly, who don't. Or, or make sure that you know, we have communities that figure out how to um, deal with people like that. I like the way that on Reddit you get karma. You get karma as a person on Reddit and as a good community, a member of the community, you rise. I think that's a brilliant innovation that they came up with, and I think social communities of the future will all have some version of that, because it's the only way to regulate each other and to get the riffraff out of the conversation who are spoiling it for the rest of us. Thank you. My name is uh, Nolan Hansen. I'm an atheist major. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whatever. And being a family that has struggled along the way, the economy and everything, how far do you actually go when you have more of, okay, I've got to spend another thousand dollars on the new latest thing? Where does that come so far in the fact that it's no longer worth it next to you? Right. 
Right. So the question is about, for those who didn't hear it, is about basically the cost of being digitally connected and how far is it going to go that we have to spend a huge portion of our income on devices, right? And are you kind of asking, is it productive to do that and worthwhile? I would say that it's productive to a point. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to upgrade to the new thing. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a lot of the upgrading to the new thing, and I'm guilty of this sometimes, is wanting to be in on the new thing and kind of be fashionable and be able to talk, one of the first people to talk about it. That's a human, natural human inclination, maybe a kind of weakness. Um, if you look back at the history of digital, I think if you kind of did a curve, I think you would find that the cost, the marginal cost of kind of being um, up to date with one's devices has been going down over time. You know, if you look at what a cell phone cost, the early, early cell phones in the 80s were only for rich people. You know, they had them in their stretch limousines and it was like completely out of touch for the rest of us. 15 years later, everybody had one. Same thing has happened with computers. You know, yes, I think the cost of an iPhone is kind of ridiculous now. Um, I think that's going to come down. I think that it is becoming more of a commodity digital. I also think that over time, you know, digital is going to be embedded in a lot of our lives and sort of do the job, this internet of things that is sort of arriving now, be doing the job quietly where we don't even need a device or much of a device to access it. And so I, I do think that um, the, the economic digital divide is a real problem now. And it's unfortunate, and there's kind of the haves and the have-nots, and I don't like that. But I think that it's sort of like telephones, you know, what happened with telephones in the first hundred years. It eventually, the cost eventually comes down, and pretty much everybody has access to it, and then we move on from there. And I think that's going to happen. Thank you. We, uh, we typically end uh, our program. Okay. And I thought Mr. Powers would be here to answer. The and to sign books. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.